So let's look at mobile communication. So you would be surprised to note that the first commercial mobile phone was launched back in 1946. And by 1948, there were 5,000 users that were placing more than 30,000 calls every day. However, the equipment that was uh, being used for supporting mobile communication was very heavy as it employed vacuum tubes. And this is because transistors were just being discovered around this uh, period. And these uh, equipment uh, for making uh, mobile calls were uh, uh, so big that they will fill up the vehicle's trunk and they drew so much power that it would cause the headlight of the car to dim when they were being operated or uh, used. So how did the first mobile network architecture look like? So it consists of, of a single transmitter on a central tower that provided a handful of channels for an entire area. And uh, uh, the way it was communicating was basically uh, that it was using a small part of the spectrum that was allocated by FCC. And there was a very tightly controlled number of subscribers who had to listen for some time on the line. And if uh, uh, finding that the line was free, they would signal to an operator and and uh, and that you they want to make a call. And during the call, the user would uh, depress a button on the handset to talk and release it to listen. So it was a very mechanical way for them to communicate. And maximum, you can have three concurrent caller at the same time. And typically, the another problem was that the transmission power required was very large because these uh, towers were very sparsely distributed across the city. And uh, uh, that, that, of course, was an extremely challenging uh, scenario. Ideally, what we would want is to have many such mobile towers distributed throughout the city. So what are the other developments that happened after uh, this early deployment of a mobile network? In 1965, mobile phones started to use more spectrum, different part of wireless spectrum in particular to use lower frequencies for communication. And of course, lower frequencies are great because it allows you to have better propagation characteristics. So now, of course, the phones also are miniaturized. You could actually fit them in a briefcase. And uh, these phones were also sort of full duplex. What it means is that it allowed you to talk and uh, listen at the same time. And how did it achieve full duplex operation? By using two separate frequencies. One was being used for uplink communication and one for downlink. Like one for uh, uh, your voice and one for the voice for, or the person on the other side of the phone. However, what, what was the challenge was that even with this increased spectrum, it was not enough. It was limited to about 40,000 subscribers, which is of course not sufficient for a city, large city like Singapore. So if you want to increase the number of users who can communicate using a, a, a mobile phone connection, how should we do it? Now we have studied various methods in this course. This includes operating on different frequencies or make sure that tra transmissions don't occur at the same time, which is also called time division, or we could uh, assign different codes to different transmitters so that even if they sort of like overlap in time and frequency, we could still uh, separate out their transmissions. However, one thing that we haven't looked at is separating these transmissions in space. And this is also called spatial division, and it is highly relevant for cellular communication. So if you look at the early mobile phone network, the, the way it was that you had these powerful towers located across the city. So what was inefficient with this uh, picture or uh, deployment? That uh, while it was able to handle a wide area coverage that you could cover the city-wide uh, scale, but the transmitters were transmitting at a strong signal and that the uh, phones also had to transmit a strong signal to reach these few uh, towers that were located in the city. And... Uh, so to provide a clear analogy, imagine if you have a lighthouse that is guiding ships in an ocean. The lighthouse needs to reach as far as possible to effectively guide the ships that are around it. So similarly, these towers need to cover a wide area to ensure seamless connectivity for mobile phones. So uh, the problem was that it actually increases the potential for interference because now your phone can has to communicate over distance as high as 40 to 60 kilometers. Secondly, most importantly, it leads to inefficient use of the spectrum. Allocating frequency or time for a specific user within such large geographical area is like reserving a very large uh, hall for a very small gathering. So it's an excessive use of a resource for a very limited purpose. And that was actually what made these original mobile phone networks to be highly inefficient. And that meant that you could only support tens of thousands of subscribers in a city. So in response to these challenges, efforts were made to limit the communication range from a tower to a smaller geographical area, and it paved the way for cellular networks. 
the primary objective was to reduce the transmit power and enable coverage to a more confined area. So let's consider another analogy to describe the transition from wide area coverage to cellular network. Now imagine a city's uh, transportation network where initially there is only one large bus that picks up and drops passengers across the city. While this bus covers a vast area, it is not efficient in terms of time, fuel consumption, and passenger capacity. Now to address these issues, the city transport transportation system restructures by introducing several smaller buses. And now each of the bus is responsible for a specific neighborhood. Now this new arrangement allows for a more targeted and efficient service, reduces overall travel time consumption while catering to the needs of the passenger across the city. So similarly in the context of telecommunication, cellular networks replace this large area coverage approach. The geographical area was divided into a number of smaller cells with each cell having its own base station which you can think from analogy perspective to be a bus to cater to the local user. And this new structure minimizes interference and optimize the spectrum usage, leading to a very uh, communi uh, efficient communication system that allowed you to increase the number of subscribers to millions. So what should be the optimal size of the cell? It is decided by considering factors such as population density, user demand, infrastructure, and base station that can be deployed. So just as city planners decide on the number of buses and their routes, uh, uh, in a similar way in cellular network, you will consider these parameters to figure out how many such uh, networks you have to deploy within a city. So what were the trade-offs that were made in special reason? We need much more towers and more importantly, as user moves from one cell to another. So if let's say you are moving from blue cell to the orange cell, how do you design the logic for handing off from a mobile phone from one tower to another and from the tower's perspective from one tower to another so that you don't notice that this change in the cell has occurred. And this is called handoff. And the important question for us is how fast should this handoff happen? And it depends on the size of the cell and also the mobile, the, the mobility of the person who's carrying the device. And there has been a lot of research on sort of like making it as efficient as possible so that you don't notice this. And uh, uh, and this sort of like has uh, now our modern cellular networks just do this uh, in a way that uh, even if you are on a train riding and you're changing the towers frequently, you don't notice uh, that uh, that sort of like your tower has changed. And this this is called handoff. And with this, we come to an end of this particular lecture.